From the moment we wake up, we're faced with decisions. Are you actually going to get out of bed or are you going to hit snooze one more time? What are you going to wear for the day? What are you going to eat for breakfast? We make choices throughout the day and those choices make us who we are. But how do we make decisions? And what part of the brain is active when we make these critical choices? Well, recently a paper was published in Nature stating that neurons in the orbital frontal cortex are crucial for decision making. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Specifically, we're going to be looking at economic choices. And all of these tie together into a whole subfield of neuroscience that's being born at the moment, which is called neuroeconomics. So without further ado, sit tight. Stay tuned, or don't, that's your decision. Let's roll the intro. Hey everybody, welcome back to NeuroSciQ, the best place on YouTube to increase your neuroscience IQ. We're back today with another week's video, and as I said in the intro, we are going to be looking at a paper called Values Encoded in the Orbital Frontal Cortex are Causally Related to Economic Choices. So, before we get started by diving into the paper, we are actually going to talk about what economic choices are, because this is something that I wasn't sure of when I read the paper, so it's something I feel that we should cover. So what is an economic choice? When we make a choice, we are required to give something up. So we're choosing which one we want and we're giving up the other choice. We have to weigh the cost and benefit of each decision. And this is essentially economics. So an economic choice is when we make a choice based off subjective preference and there is no right or wrong. So for instance, when you wake up in the morning and choose what shirt you're going to wear, you usually choose your favorite. But some days you might be going to a business meeting or a job interview and you might not choose your favorite shirt because it might be your most comfortable shirt. You might have to choose something that's a little less comfortable but more appeasing. That is an economic choice. The next part of the title that I want to just go through before we get right into the paper is how do we establish casualty? So if you are taking any science courses or maybe not, maybe you've heard before that correlation doesn't mean causation. So just because things seem to correlate to each other doesn't mean that that's the cause. But how can we establish causation in science? Well, we need three things to do so. First, we need correlation. And for neuroscience, it could be like what neural activity is associated with the particular behavioral outcome. So the authors of the paper we're looking at today actually did previous work. So in this paper, what they did was they looked at neuron firing. So you can go into a brain and record spikes from a neuron, and then you can associate the spikes to a behavior. So this is what they did in the orbital frontal cortex when they had monkeys choosing between juice. So they had juice A and juice B, and they presented the options on a screen and then the monkeys made a choice. And when they made the choice, we saw firing in the orbital frontal cortex. But what they also noticed was that the spikes seemed to be related to value. So interestingly, the monkeys prefer juice A. So maybe we can pretend juice A is apple and they didn't like flavor B, which is banana, as much. The only time they would choose B over A is when they were offered four times the amount of juice. So let's say the experimenters offered the monkeys one juice box that was apple juice and four juice box that were banana. Well, because the monkeys like apple juice more, you'd think they might choose the apple juice, but actually there was way more banana juice offered, so they would go for choice B in that case. So the value of the choice depends on the flavor and the amount. And what the researchers saw was when there was more value, there was more activity in the orbitofrontal cortex. 
Now, these juices were presented one at a time, so they would present the apple juice, there would be a little amount of spiking. Then they presented four banana juices, and the neurons would start firing, and there would be a lot of activity because there's a higher value. So, they associated the orbitofrontal cortex neuron firing with the value of the choices presented. Now, that's not enough to establish causation. The next two things that need to be established are necessity and sufficiency. The experiment they conducted was actually very similar to the one I described earlier. So they were presenting monkeys with choices between juice. And again, the monkeys preferred one juice over the other. Apple was better than banana. But they would go for the choice that they didn't like as much if they were offered the right amount. Now what they did was they stimulated the neurons. With high stimulation, we can actually impair the activity. With low stimulation, we can facilitate activity. Okay, so they predicted that if the orbital frontal cortex was somehow inhibited or disrupted, then this would influence the decision making. And that is actually what they saw. The way they tested this was by looking at four different conditions. So either they presented apple juice first and then banana juice, or they presented banana juice first and then apple juice. And then they also varied whether or not they were stimulating the orbital frontal cortex during presentation. What they saw if we look at this sigmoidal curve was that with the presentation of A and then B, we have our normal curve. And the same thing happens if you present B first and then A. So those are the orange curve and the light blue curve. So what we see at the beginning is the forced choice where they're only given the option of choosing apple. So obviously none of their choices would be banana because there's no other option. And then at the end we also see another forced choice where they are given the option of just banana. So obviously every single time they're going to choose banana. So we have very similar curves when there is no stimulation. Now, they added stimulation when the first choice was presented, and this is high voltage stimulation of the orbital frontal cortex, which is going to disrupt the activity. So, if we look at the AB option, so that's looking at the red line and the brown line. If we look at the red line and the brown line, what we see is we have our normal red line and brown line, but now if we're stimulating when A is presented, we have a shift to the left. So we're shifting the brown line to the left. Why is that happening? Well, this is because we're devaluing choice A. So now the monkeys are going to switch their decision to choice B faster. It doesn't matter how much banana you offer them. And if you look, it looks like if you offer five banana juices and three apples, they'll switch their choice pretty rapidly to banana, even though they like apple juice better. Whereas the choice before, the switch was happening at around five to two. So you had to offer them five bananas and two apples and they'd make the switch to banana. But now, with a five to three, they're switching. The same thing happens the other way around. So now if we're stimulating when B is presented, banana, which they already don't like, we're now disrupting the evaluation of this choice. So if we look at the light blue line and then we look at the dark blue line, now we've stimulated during the presentation of B, so B doesn't seem to have too much value, so we are actually going to shift that line to the right. The reason why we're shifting to the right is because now we've devalued B even more. So to get them to choose B, we have to offer a lot more. In the second condition, they stimulated the brain during the presentation of the second stimulus. So if they presented apple juice and then they presented banana, they would stimulate during the second presentation. And we see similar effects, but it looks like there's a larger effect. If you look at the graph, there's more variance between the lines. Why does this happen? Well, that's because when you stimulate and disrupt during the presentation of the second stimulus, we're not only disrupting value computation, but we're also disrupting value comparison. So it's more disruptive and that's why there's a bigger difference 
between the stimulated conditions and the normal conditions. So that's what happens when we disrupt the orbital frontal cortex. Now, if we lower the stimulation a little bit, we're actually going to facilitate activity in the orbital frontal cortex, and that's what they did in the next experiment. Now, the scientists said that based on the fact that these A and B neurons, so neurons for apple juice and neurons for banana juice, are randomly organized in the orbital frontal cortex, no matter where you put the electrode, it's going to have the same effect on each neuronal population. So the change in value for A should be the same as the change in value for B. So in this experiment, rather than presenting the juices one after the other, they presented both at the same time, and that means that both of the values would increase. So what they predicted is that the line should shift. They found that this actually does happen. So when the stimulation was off, we have this black line and the black line is our normal. When we stimulate during the presentation of the choices, we should shift to the left. And so that is what they see. Why does it shift to the left? Well, that's because now A, which they already valued even more, it's going to have greater value. But B is also going to have greater value, that's why the graph maintains the same shape, but it all just moves towards the left. They also realized with this that the monkeys reacted faster. So as we can see, if we disrupt the orbital frontal cortex, then we're disrupting the computation of value for a stimulus. But also if we facilitate it, we can increase the value that a stimulus has. This kind of tackled both necessity and sufficiency, but I would still caution whether or not we can say that causality is established with this experiment. I still think more research needs to be done, but I'm interested in hearing what you folks think. So leave any comments you have down below. The two articles will be in the description. And make sure you like, comment, and subscribe for more future videos. Remember, if you have any ideas, leave them down below so I don't have to decide what the video topic should be.